From the dawn of time, there has been many podcasts that failed to live up to the hype and left you wanting more. That time is over. The podcast you've all been waiting for is here. The Scripted Podcast. Open your ear holes for this. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, wow, man. All right, welcome back to the Scripted Podcast. Today on the show, we are talking about voiceovers, John. What comes to mind when you first think of voiceovers? Uh, I'd say like cartoons, maybe. You yeah, know? me too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but if you're in the marketing or advertising world and you're creating video content or audio content for your business, as you should be, you're going to need voiceover. Uh, right. You're going to come across that problem eventually. It's inevitable. So where do you go to get it? Uh, how do you, you don't want to do it yourself and, you know, have your own Philly accent, uh, <laughs> yeah. across the world. So, um, one place you could go is voices.com and we happen to have their co-founder and CEO, David Cicerelli here to help us understand that world a little better. That's right. And not just that, Kevin, we're also joined today by John Kubin, who is a, uh, very accomplished voice actor. Uh, and also runs a company called Spexter that we're going to be talking a little bit about. But uh, for now, let's uh, start with David and we'll go from there. Hi, David. Welcome to the show. Hey, Kevin. Hey, John. Good to be here, guys. Um, yeah, lo love to talk about all things voice. So let's do this. Yeah, yeah. let's get in there. So, uh, yeah, just give us a little background. Like, how did you end up founding, co-founding with your wife, uh, a voiceover company? Yeah, that's right. Um, we are co-founders and I'll uh, refrain from uh, positioning this too much as a love story, but uh, I, I did go to school for, to become an audio engineer. You know, I grew up being really interested in sound, you know, tinkering with, uh, you know, an old record player as a kid. And I remember this shortwave radio, I could dial into stations from around the world and hear people even speaking in different languages, which is really cool. So I think that um, fascination just carried forward to you know, when you graduate from high school, what do you want to become when you grow up, so to speak? So I found this audio engineering program that was pretty, pretty fascinating. Um, and uh, when I did graduate, I opened up actually a small recording studio and got my name in the local newspaper on my birthday of all days. And that's how I met um, Stephanie, as you mentioned, uh, who's now my wife and, and uh, of course, co-founder. Um, at the time, she was studying to become a music major uh, at the university. And she actually had to record her singing repertoire uh, as one of her assignments. And her mom actually knew this and caught out the newspaper article that she saw and left it for her on her bed um, and says, hey, why don't you go down to this new studio and uh, get your get your, you know, singing portfolio recorded? Um, so she came down and, and we did certainly hit it off. But uh, because of that uh, original article, there were other small businesses uh, that, you know, contacted me. They said, hey, um, we have a phone system that needs to get its greetings, kind of the voicemail greeting and that on hold message uh, updated. There's a local hair salon that wants some commercials uh, being done on, on for local radio. And they, they both had the same request, which was for a female talent. Uh, clearly, that wasn't my gig. I'm the engineer, but I did just meet Stephanie the, the, the day before. Um, so I, I asked, hey, do you think um, and this was not my wedding proposal or marriage proposal, but I did ask, hey, do you think you can be the female voice talent and I'll be the engineer and we'll just split the money 50-50? So that was uh, not only how I found my dear wife, but also how we started this crazy business together. Wow. Yeah. Quite a bit of a <laughs> serendipity on uh, yeah. both your <laughs> personal and professional life. Yeah, exactly. I, I mean, you know, to, if I mean, I mean, what I think we realized very quickly, you know, we, we certainly worked well together. Um, but, you know, I put up a pretty, you know, basic primitive, I call it a primitive, you know, website. It was just this brochure style website, no database behind it, nothing fancy. Um, and, uh, you know, both of us went down to the local library. We read on, you know, Adobe Dreamweaver and web design for dummies and, and just kind of took out all the books and taught ourselves how to create a web page in HTML, which is very different than nowadays, like WordPress does 99% of the heavy lift for, yep. for you if you, wanna, if you want your own um, website. So uh, we put up this site, it actually attracted other freelancers, um, creative talent from around the world, 
well, really pr- predominantly around North America who, you know, uh, wanted to be a voice listed on this site. Um, uh, you know, people who are, uh, spoke, speak other languages, who did ever kind of character voices, right. um, celebrity impersonations. So that's really kind of, we always just said, yes, you could be listed on the site. And then concurrently, um, there were clients that would also find this site, um, say, how do I get in touch with these people? Can I hire them? And that was the, you know, what I call the aha moment of, wow, we should, you know, get out of the recording business ourselves and instead, you know, serve as that trusted intermediary. Like, let's reinvent this, you know, site as a a marketplace where we connect that voice buying client, you know, as you mentioned, marketers, ad agencies, creative producers, with the voice talent, people who work from home studios who have great voices, um, maybe a background in arts and entertainment or broadcasting, and are looking to, uh, you know, leverage those skills and capabilities and uh, work on fascinating projects. So that's that's really the story, and, and we've been doing that um, really for for the better part of uh, over ten years. And uh, I just stuck to that one uh, one niche. That's incredible. What what would you say? You know, the has the industry changed since the time that you first started it to now, and and what kind of changes have you experienced? Uh, yeah, the, I mean, the industry's um, one of the key drivers actually is I'd say just in the equipment, like the accessibility. You know, um, it's it's very different than recording, you know, a, a garage band or hip hop or something where like maybe well, especially like you know rock bands where you need drums and guitars and amps and all these microphones and it's just like there's a lot more to it right voiceover it's really one track right so right. the most important thing you need is actually a quiet room everyone thinks it's all about the microphone but i would argue a quiet soundproofed room is going to do you way better than having a really high-end microphone and so this could be as simple as soundproofing your room with foam or sleeping bags or extra blankets, yep. uh, which a lot of talent actually do in like spare bedrooms or even closets. They kind of convert that into a vocal booth. Um, so I think the cost and accessibility of entering in is is one thing. And then the you know disbursement of work has gone from being geographically centered in New York, Chicago, and LA to really, if there's, an, if there's a market, that there's an advertising market really globally, um, that there's a need for voiceover. Uh, and so I think that's been another uh, driver. And then just the type of content that's being produced as well, too. So, you know, it used to be, you know, as we, you guys talked about, you know, oh, I think of cartoons. Right. Um, and a lot of people think, oh, I get it, voiceover. It's radio and TV commercials. That's actually only about 10%, maybe 15% of the market that we would, would be characterized as quote unquote broadcast work. The other 85% is non broadcast. It's like, more industrial in nature. Think of it like, you know, you can talk about these phone system recordings, corporate training videos, ah. maybe a kiosk. Like sometimes there's even compliance videos as well too that, you know, just need to get just need to get done. And I think businesses are recognizing, let's make this like an engaging experience for both our employees uh, or maybe even educational content that actually gets uh, shared with customers. So kind of all that non-broadcast, it's not an ad, it's more educational in nature or informative. That's actually the bulk of the market. And it makes sense. And before voices came along, how did those jobs get done? Like where did yeah, those I mean, businesses- the industry's, uh, it's, in, it's kind of fascinating uh, history. I mean, the industry has been around um, you know, really since the days of, you know, Walt Disney himself doing the first voice, I think in 1926, if I can uh, get that correct, um, for uh, the precursor to uh, Mickey Mouse, which was Steamboat Willie. Right. So it's like the very first black and white animated, um, hand drawn animation. And Walt Disney did the voice. And then that led to um, a fellow who's hired by Warner Brothers called Mel Blank. He was like, I think, like, kind of characterizes like the man of a thousand voices. Mm-hmm. Yep. And he did Tweety Bird and Bugs Bunny and Porky Pig and all the Warner Brother Brothers characters. So that's kind of the the origins. And, you know, because of them being in the arts and entertainment industry, they're often um, the artists were signed on as part of the Screen Actors Guild or the union, the Performing Arts Union in the United States. Um, and that industry, like that was kind of like really the controlling factor and construct for really up until about the year 2000, where there was a performing artists arts strike by the Screen Actors Guild. And that caused a lot of upheaval, upheaval, both the the emergence of 
you know, basically people still needing to do work or, or producers or ad agencies still need work to get done. Uh, and then they would go and hire a freelance or what was kind of characterized as like a non-union talent. Um, right, now right. we just talk about them as independent talent. Uh, so that was kind of one of the big changes. And they would just get booked into a recording, a local recording studio. So how the work would get done is you'd put out a casting call, you know, a job posting in effect, a number of talent agents who represented these unionized talent would be put forth. You know, you get these time slots, you just got five minutes to, you know, record an, um, I should say audition in person. <laughs> and then from there you would actually be, um, you know, either do a callback, but all of that would be kind of narrowed down to, to this one talent that you might work with. Not process. I mean, work, sometimes there'd be like a casting director, you know, the person with the golden ears who's helping make that decision. Right. That process would, you know, hiring a casting director in, in New York or LA is like somewhere between a thousand and fifteen hundred bucks. Yeah. Um, and then the, the actual recording studio time, a couple hundred dollars an hour. So next thing you know, we're talking like twenty five hundred dollars just to find the talent. Uh, who I might want to actually work with on this project. And then you actually have to pay the talent and kind of repeat the process for the actual recording. So that was um, kind of a slow and, and dare I say cumbersome process, um, including like the legalities with the union contract and so forth. And I think over the last, certainly over the last 10, if not, you know, 15 years, particularly advertisers have needed to turn projects around very quickly you know, I need the thing yesterday. I want to spin up a campaign. Some world event happens. I need to change my messaging very quickly. And, um, and the content shelf life is very short. Nowadays, when you see something on social media, I only want to watch it once. If I've seen it before, I'm probably just going to skip ahead. So there's this like desire to be much more nimble in terms of like brand ad, or, you know, brands themselves or like their, their counterparts as the ad agencies. You just need to turn things around much faster so that old legacy traditional the way, way that um, work would get procured really just doesn't lend itself to, I think, the fast moving culture that, uh, that we all find ourselves in today. Yeah, I was very curious about that. Would you say that a lot of the production has just gone digital. Are they still doing any form of in-person for these sessions or is it? Well, for the, I mean, there's a, there's certainly a time and a place for it. I think, you know, if you're going to hire a celebrity, which of candidly, course. very few people do, um, there's almost a certain, like, this is like, a, it's almost becomes like an event in and of itself, right? Like, right. Oh, we're working with, you know, name your favorite celebrity. Um, they're coming into the studio. Um, you, it, it becomes almost like an experience for that brand who you know got to hire so and so for uh, for their campaign. Um, aside from that, though, I mean, most of the work definitely has shifted to the majority uh, to be this freelance independent work as opposed to like the the you know old uh, union construct. It does exist, but uh, absolutely, you know, since the onset of the pandemic. All the studios shut down in New York, LA. So this is like yet again, this another catalyst towards embracing remote recording um, talent where you just hop on, you know, a Zoom, Google, uh, Google Meet, Skype, just to have some face to face and do the kind of creative direction where you feel like you're collaborating in, in, in person, sure. but you're just, just doing it through video. You know, our feedback from speaking with clients who actually do the hiring, there's uh, they once they've kind of realized and kind of, oh, wow, this is actually pretty convenient. I don't need to travel to a studio and I also don't need to pay the talent to go into the studio. They can do this from home. This is amazing. Yeah. They're going to save the time and money. And so I just, you know, they said they're not going back. Um, and I can, I can certainly see why from the cost and time savings. And did you see an influx of COVID related, um, not only uh, customers, but for actors applying to the site as well? I know we Absolutely. did. I know we saw. Oh yeah. I mean, it was, a, it's been a um, crazy year and, um, I recognize, obviously, COVID's been very challenging on everyone uh, in in their own way, both you know personally and you know certainly the the mental challenge of just being you know stuck at home um, in in a lot of cases, uh, and you know the response to that, especially those who maybe immediately were laid off or maybe had a fear of even being laid off, 
um, like many of us, maybe even looked online of like, okay, how do I make money from home? Mm -hmm. And, uh, or what, how do I, you know, and people thinking, how do I leverage the skills that I have into finding a side hustle or a side gig? And so absolutely we had, um, like some days there was like, I think one day we had 50,000 people sign up over kind of like a, a couple day period, you know, several months, even nowadays, yeah. like there's about a hundred thousand voice talent, uh, or, you know, people signing up as voice talent, obviously their, you know, level of skill is going to vary greatly. Um, but it's about a hundred thousand people a month who are uh, signing up, which is very different than kind of two, three years ago. It might've been more like, you know, five to 10,000 a month. So let's call it a tenfold increase in the amount of interest. Wow. Um, but yeah. then that's kind of like the first step, you know, you realize it's more than just, uh, talking into a microphone. I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions. Um, you need that home studio as well. Yeah. I want to talk about that a little bit. I know, I mean, with a hundred thousand people signing up, what is your vetting process? What is it? I guess if I'm an aspiring voice actor, which maybe I am, you don't know, uh, <laughs> what does it, what, what makes a great voice actor? What, what elements do they need? We we call it um, we call it the uh, the triple threat right which is you need um, I'm going to go out on a limb like the the, the God given gift of a great voice let's call it the art right. right the artistic element you need this you need the skill and the and, and the ability to read a page of copy right or read a script and and bring that script to life that means. Uh, being in character means kind of interpreting, you know, this artistic direction. So let's, let's call it all the artistic aspects. Then definitely the norm nowadays is having the home base recording studio. Right. So it could be as simple as, you know, a closet that's outfitted. Um, you know, the equipment could be, you know, a MacBook Pro and a USB microphone. It actually does not need to be all that complicated, certainly to, uh, to get started. And the third one, um, I'd argue, is some type of like, you know, business or marketing and communication skills, uh, which really means how are you marketing yourself online? Do you have your own website? Are you maintaining a social media presence? Um, are you participating in a marketplace that uh, you really kind of mastered this as a lead generation tool? I know how to respond to these jobs. I'm winning one out of 25, one out of 50, one out of 100. So um, I, I'm kind of working that system to be able to generate an income. Uh, and so I think those are those are probably the elements that, you know, may surprise some. It's, it's not necessarily the person with the deepest voice or even the person with the most experience. Somebody could have a lot of experience in that old world, but is having challenging uh, challenges translating I used to just walk into a studio and someone would hit record for me and I'd read and then leave to now it really is an independent business owner. Right, you right. are, you are a talent. Yes. But you're also the engineer. You're also the marketer. You're also the, the bookkeeper to make sure you're getting paid. So I think it's, it's the, those who are most successful, maybe to put a bow on it are those who view the pursuit of voice acting as a career, actually as a, you know, an entrepreneurial path. That makes sense. Do you, what kind of, so obviously there's a sort of a changing of the guard happening now, but you know, where do you find that the vast majority of these voice actors are coming from? Are they, you know, uh, already kind of formally trained actors or is that changing already? I think, um, you know, the, 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 the trained actors, I mean, this is going to be a huge benefit if you, you know, if you've taken an improv class, if you've gone through some kind of drama or theater program, right? That's going to be a huge, uh, a huge benefit. Um, so, you know, I, I would kind of there's this whole like transferable skills um, that are uh, definitely um, you know present, and 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 people you know c you know come from uh, that place. Um, but interesting with voice acting, it's, it's, it's almost has this like cachet of like, you see the celebrities do the behind the scenes and like, wow, they're in their pajamas. And this looks like <laughs> really easy to do. I think it has an appeal because you're actually not on camera, right? Because you can kind of let go a little bit and you have this air of anonymity that you aren't necessarily exposed and people don't know who you are. Um, I'm being hired based upon my voice and capabilities 
not because somebody likes what I look like. It's because something I can do. Exactly. And I, I think that absolutely uh, appeals to uh, a great number of people who, uh, you know, value their value, their privacy and don't feel like they need to, they, they, you know, um, they they want to be somebody else, um, you know, which is kind of what, you know, that this type of new jobs every day, I, one day I'm a, you know, talking caterpillar. The next day I'm a talking robot. The next day I'm a corporate executive who's delivering <laughs> an important message. So I think that's kind of what keeps it interesting. So maybe, maybe John, I mean, as you said, like that's where this, like, if you come from this acting background, you almost have this, you know, flexibility and like this, you know, stretching of your vocal talents kind of built in you, that really appeals to you. Yeah, I think actually a lot of people don't recognize how difficult it is. I actually have done some voice acting work myself and there is a lot of crossover as well, even with traditional acting. I know that some voice actors I've even spoken to even still stick with doing some physical element while they're performing it just to get, you know, some degree of performance out of it. Oh yeah, there's this whole debate of like sit versus stand, even right. if, you're, if you're in the vocal booth. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people are quite on the, no, you should be standing, you should be moving your arms around. Um, the only reason you'd be probably sitting is if you are like recording an audiobook and it's like nine hours <laughs> and you know, you're doing it to like save your legs um, than anything else. But yeah, it's, it's this notion of physicality and performance. Um, just like, you know, are, are you going to um, give a better speech if you're just kind of standing stiff behind the podium? Or can I actually walk around? Oh, I've got a wireless headset. I can move. Right. I can try to, you know, engage the audience. That's going to deliver a better performance. Or even if you have to make a sales call or talk to a customer, um, it's really always best to be standing up doing that. If you've like walked through sales floors in like a business to business environment, these kind of software tech companies, almost everyone's standing because they can, it just keeps the energy up. And I think that same concept uh, translates to doing a vocal performance that you also want to be, you know, moving and kind of, you know, just leaning into it and just adding that extra degree of uh, emotion into the read. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, you, you mentioned uh, the variety of different jobs that you can find yourself in as a voice actor. Can you tell us maybe the oddest job that's come to voices <laughs> uh one that comes to mind is um there is this voice it was a request from a outdoor theme park it was a water park in florida and they wanted the voice for a pirate and at the time we just had this like you know on the job posting form like describe kind of who you're looking for and they just said pirate and wow, like, lo and behold, you wouldn't believe the diversity of pirate voices. <laughs> like, you don't, like, you know, it's for a mascot, but, like, do you really want it sounding like, you know, if you remember the movie, you know, the Disney movie, uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, like, sure. do you want the scary Davy Jones, like, skeleton-looking thing, or, like, you know, with the octopus, you know, chin, <laughs> like, that's kind of a frightening pirate, right. but it's a pirate. And, or do you want the goofy Johnny Depp pirate, because that's a whole other flavor of pirate so we realized that in the request that we were kind of doing a disservice to the client they obviously pictured some kind of pirate in their head mm. but we 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 didn't give them this other capability of dis they described the role but they didn't describe the style and so, I mean, this is basic, you know, basics of like character sketching, right? Like, what does this person look like? Like, what would they sound like? Um, and that's, I think, one that has been kind of pretty funny, but, it's, you know, it kind of lends to this notion of artistic direction mm -hmm. um, that voice, and this is really the challenge. It's like, we're creating the invisible here. Like, it's something you, an intangible, it's something you hear. We all hear it the same way, but if you didn't hear it, you like you hear it in your head and it's really hard to describe and people just lack a lexicon um, or like the terminology to describe in their head. And they often resort to 
you know, very, you know, vague and general terms of the kind of voice that they're looking for. So case in point, you know, I want somebody who sounds professional. Mm. Okay. Is that like Mm -hmm. you want a corporate executive or is that really more of an indication of like the quality of recording? Yes. It's the quality of recording. Okay. So who is it that you're looking for? That's where we came up with this idea of like having, you know, a role, you get to pick the role of the character that you want to read. Ah, so it could be character, or sorry, it could be a cowboy, it could be a villain, it could be a, you know, doctor, it could be a superhero, it could be a guy next door, you know, soccer mom, like go down, like there's, we got this big list of these kind of common characters that you'd find. And then there's the style, which is funny or sarcastic or serious, you know, it's like, that's kind of w- w- where this needs to come, um, come together and in the absence of those two, you know, um, options on this job posting form, we would get clients that would say, "Oh, I just need you to. I need somebody who sounds purple." And it's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, a lot of similarities. You're, you're, here. you're giving me the brand colors of your logo, <laughs> and you're asking, like, I don't know how that's supposed to sound. Or one of my other favorite ones. Um, Kevin, cause you asked was, you know, I need you to sound taller. You know, we need somebody who can sound tall. It's like, do you mean authoritative? Do you mean imposing? Like, what is it that you're actually getting at? Because tall ha- is just ripe for, you know, misinterpretation. And so I think maybe for, uh, those listening, if you're thinking about your vocal, like your, your voice brand or your audio brand, you know, if your brand, you know, could walk into a room, what would it look like? What would it sound like? And is there almost like a character? Because it's easy if it's a mascot, um, because oh, if you have a mascot, you're like, okay, yeah, I get, I, I understand what this character would look like uh, because there is a mascot, but what would they sound like? So many brands just have not put that forward or their mascots have never spoken. Like, Mc- Ronald McDonald basically never speaks. Yeah. The Energizer Bunny never speaks. Yet there's new audio channels for marketing like smart speakers, like uh, you know, having them as a user instead of the brand Energizer showing up on Clubhouse or Twitter Spacers. Like imagine the Energizer Bunny like showed up and had a conversation about you know, getting the most battery life. I don't know what the conversation, but you know what I mean? Like if (laughs) brands have an opportunity to personify, um, you know, themselves as an organization through the human voice, which just didn't pre-exist. And they've not, most people have not thought about this. Um, Perhaps I think about it because I'm like deep into it, but it's, it's shocking that there are like global brands that don't really, they're not clear on what they should sound like. 100%. I, I, uh, a brand guide very often does not include a sound section. Um, no, so we there's a brand um, guidelines that we we thought well let's listen let's try to walk the walk here. So in um, you know if, if again those listening wanted to see an example of what a uh, Sonic brand guidelines you know might look like, um, we've done one ourselves. So uh, if you go to voices.com, you'll see there's a, I think, press section at the bottom and it's in the media kit. And basically it's a PDF download that walks through like, hey, here's our overarching Sonic brand guidelines. You know, the emotions that we're trying to evoke, um, kind of where we would and wouldn't want to appear and kind of sounds like the type of music that might accompany our brand. And then we also have what's called a sound logo. So some people might have heard like the Intel chime or the Netflix chime when you first boot up Netflix or even Apple when you, you know, turn on a Mac, you know, there's these kind of three to four note musical signatures. And so those are actually becoming popular, whether it's, you know, you're turning on a physical piece of hardware, right? uh, Or you're actually calling into a contact center. I often see these tagged on the end of videos, which is where we use ours the most. Right. Um, So we have it on the, uh, our our sound logo, which is like, usually they're again, like three, four, five, six notes. Um, and or they can have a blend of uh, a voice in it as well too, which ours uh, appropriately does. So, um, but in terms of guidelines, maybe you can uh, th- that might be a good uh, resource uh, for for folks kind of considering like, well, how would I even articulate this? Um, hopefully, ours might serve as a as a template. Yeah, and it mirrors what we tell our customers too. Um, yeah, I was thinking the same thing. For for our end, it's the content brief. 
The content brief is the most essential part of ordering content. If you're going to have a successful content project, it starts with the, like a very detailed brief, knowing exactly what you want, being able to communicate it to the freelancer. And it sounds like you guys have a, a pretty good handle on that as well. You obviously ran into that, I'm sure, early on, like with customers coming in saying, I want to sound purple. Uh, I'm sure that was a, a difficult process to kind of figure out what is it that they're not getting that we need mm -hmm. to be able to communicate to these freelancers. I, th I think that that's almost kind of native to anyone that's looking to hire a freelancer in this case, because you know naturally it's the same with us at Scripted. Sometimes content briefs can be very vague. Um, and you know primarily if they were able to write a good content brief, they wouldn't need a writer in the first place. And that's obviously where a lot of, you know, that sort of <laughs> same thing that's probably happening with voices is, you know, describe, give, give us a character that's purple is the reason why they're on voices uh it's a challenge well, the, the, the irony is um we actually do have uh barney the purple dinosaur which is like a, a hit character <laughs> in tv show i guess in the early 2000s um he's actually his name is dean went um and he's one of the most popular and most hired guys on our platform right now not because <laughs> He was Barney, but he's actually just really talented. Awesome. Um, so there are, uh, you know, those situations where it's like, are you referring to Barney the dinosaur? Or are you actually right. uh, looking for someone purple, meaning, oh, passionate or royalty? You want this like, you know, what what is it? And this is as much as you try to, you know, kind of draw it out. Um, but, I, you know, and, and, in, and in fairness, I actually hadn't contemplated that you know, the, a writing brief is the same thing. It's like someone has a, a, a vision in their head and it's like our job to draw that out and get them to describe it in, you know, pixels on a screen. Exactly. And that is like, most people almost, they're like, well, you know, don't you just kind of, oh, just write 500 words for me. It's like, well, no, like, you know, what's the tone? And yeah, and, and, and then likewise, and tone, the same yeah. thing, we call that the style. Well, how do you want like the tone I can read this sentence, you know, any number of ways. Um, we actually have uh, uh, an exercise for employee onboarding at Voices. We talk about the importance of culture and like how communication is like mostly nonverbal. And I put up, I, you know, put up this uh, one line on the screen and I say, I want you to read this and put an emphasis under each, uh, under the word that you see. And the, the sentence is, I didn't say that to her. Right, but it can it can say sound. I didn't say that to her, which is like, well, I didn't, but somebody else did. Right, right. Or I didn't say that to her, or I didn't say that to her. <laughs> I, you know, I didn't say that to her. I said it to him, and I think it it gives this. Um, it really kind of hits home when everyone is like, guys, when you're sending, you know, Slack messages and Gmails back and forth, and if it's just a chat. And it's just written in a certain way. It's so easy to be interpreted the wrong way by the recipient because they're missing and lacking the sense of tone. So you got to figure out, and I know I'm like, you know, preaching to the choir here. It's like, you got to figure out, like infuse tone into your message right. because in the, in the absence of that, you're just leaving it up for interpretation. And similarly, like, in, it describe the tone that you're looking for when you're hiring a voice talent. Otherwise, you're leaving it up for interpretation, and you will get like the wide diversity of pirates, like the uh, like the theme park did, and so forth. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think that the the further you can get, and the closest you can get to what your vision is, and then letting the freelancer take it from there, you're going to get much much closer to what it is you need. Um, I have to ask because we've we've name dropped Barney now. Who else do you got on there? Any, any, uh, I mean, and also if there are any big names that are also on voices, are a lot of them using pen names? That's sort of the situation that we have on scripted at times. Yeah, we, um, a couple years ago, we actually ended up acquiring a company called voice bank, uh, and voice bank was, um, a similar platform that really only, uh, showcased or was like home to, all the big talent agencies. So creative artist agency, William Morris Endeavor, like United Talent, this is all the big ones. Um, and they actually all listed their celebrities. Um, and we've since uh, kind of migrated that experience onto voices.com. So there was a while there um, 
where we, you know, th- there was all of these celebrities. I mean, like Matthew McConaughey had like the funniest, you know, uh, someone, and they all had like these voice demos as well too. Like they were just really entertaining and engaging and they were like A-list celebrities. Wow. Um, that we found, uh, so, I mean, they're, they're definitely, there are some that prefer to be represented. Well, op- for obvious reasons, you know, represented by their agent who can field those inbound requests. Um, but a lot of people aren't even gonna, like, they're like, you want to hire me, then hire me, um, through my agent. I'm not doing an audition for you. Like if you right. really want me, I'm going to walk into the studio for like no less than, you know, sometimes like six figures, like right. that's just, they're not going to enter into that engagement. Um, so, th- you know, that certainly occurs. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the, the ph- phenomenon, uh, you call them like pen names, we call them stage names. Right, so right. It's the same, yep. same issue where they just don't want to be, um, I, I, perhaps maybe, you know, ex, you know, accessed a bunch like, Oh, like, you know, through, through fans sure. or people are like just kind of wasting their time. Um, or perhaps they're, you know, they might be, a you know, a B list or a C list celebrity, or like they were really popular on a show a couple of years ago, but you know, work comes and goes. So maybe they just, they're actually really talented right. and, 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 but they, you know, they're, they're looking for the next gig. So, um, they kind of want to fly a little bit under the radar and you know, that that's fine with us as well too. We don't, you know, we don't make a point of, you know, trying to highlight, um, there's no kind of celebrity section or right. anything along Same. those lines. Uh, although maybe it makes sense to do so. So thanks. thanks for the idea. <laughs> yeah, that we, maybe we'll talk about that as well for scripted. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's something I think that happens quite a bit. Yeah. David, before we let you go, um, I want to ask you, you kind of, you started out as an audio engineer and you ended up as a co-founder of a voiceover company. Um, where do you see your company going? Where do you see the market going um, over the next few years? Well, definitely the market is going to be, you know, more freelance uh, and independent talent work. Um, you see that through the enormous rise of massive players like Upwork and Fiverr, who both had incredible years. Um, you know, I'm, I read all of their financial statements because they're both publicly traded companies. Right. Um, both had really huge growth years um, and are continuing to, to push in that. Um, so with those two leading the way, I think there's almost like this general awareness that it's not just freelance or gig work. Like it actually makes sense in a lot of situations um, where there's these customer scenarios where you actually, it, it, it makes more sense to hire an independent creative talent on perhaps uh, you know contract or limited contract basis or an extended project basis, um, either because of lean times, you just need to like scale back and and you know work do work as needed. Maybe there's a surge in activity because you landed a big contract or you're about to launch a big campaign. So again, it's not going to be there always. So it makes sense to you know again consider a, a an independent. And then lastly. Um, you know, this, this kind of variable mode of like these surges and, 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 you know, peaks and valleys, if you will. Um, so I, I think those are three customer scenarios that, um, that would continue to drive this uh, adoption of freelance creative talent and, and working with independent talent. Um, you know, and the other driver is just how much content is, is almost like digital first. And, and, and this might seem a little bit, you know, passe, but like really the amount that we're all spending on screens. And now I, I think almost to the point it's reached a bit of a saturation where now it's almost like, oh, I'm actually more willing to listen to a podcast or just hear a clubhouse chat going on in the background and engage away from screen, maybe just through earbuds, like right. this kind of augmented listening experience. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think is is another big trend. So our response at at Voices is, um, why don't you know? What if we viewed ourselves more as enabling more of that creative process, particularly on um, sometimes these scripts need to be translated into other languages. So we think that there's an opportunity there. Uh, and then you know after the voice is recorded, sometimes you know there just needs to be some editing. Like let's remove out all of the all the breaths, or let's tighten this up, or you know, cut out a section of a podcast recording um, or create variations on, you know, on, on an ad. So this is like this editing, perhaps even mixing in music. So, 
you know, we're, we're almost going through uh, advoices.com this like reinvention, if you will, um, to become a more of a creative services marketplace. Right. So mm-hmm. we've got some big plans for um, over the next couple months. Um, and, but that's going to be a big one that uh, hopefully all of you see uh, roll out and can be uh, part of the story as well. For sure. And it seems like, you know, scalability and being able to be nimble. Um, is, is really the future here. And, and, and unfortunately, we will have to cut out your mention of Fiverr and Upwork as they are. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's right. That's right. But you know, yeah. <laughs> you can still go to Scripted, get your scripts written uh, before you <laughs> go to voices.com to, to find your voice talent. Exactly. Well, thank well, you so much for joining it. us, David. No, it's it's been a great chat. You guys are uh, highly engaged, and um, I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to uh, to tell our story. Yeah, Thanks, we David. were thrilled to hear it. All right, then. Thank you so much. We're also joined today by John Kubin. John is a multi-talented entrepreneur currently based out of Pasadena, California, where he works most prolifically as a voiceover artist. John has built his own production company, Pretty Nifty, and is also the CEO and founder of Spexter, a platform built for filmmakers to stream and spec content to advertisers in order to get hired for production jobs. He joins us today to talk a little bit about what it's like to be a freelance voiceover artist and some of the projects he's currently working on. John, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Of course, thrilled to have you. So. Tell us a little bit about uh, what brings you here today. How did you get started with voice acting? It's you know it's been a journey, um, and thanks so much for having me. This is awesome. Uh, I started out uh, in voiceover kind of accidentally, I think, as a lot of people do in in these interesting careers. Right. Um, I'm a you know kid from Kansas of about a hundred people in the town total, and. I just, you know, on a whim, decided he was going to move to Hollywood and <laughs> was face palming pretty hard for a couple of years doing that. <laughs> right. But um, I had been doing music uh, basically most of my life and uh, learned how to play a lot of different instruments and tried to sing. And I was just a god awful singer. And so my music career wasn't going to work out too good with that being the case. <laughs> and so I moved to LA. I, I always loved performing and you know, came out to do the whole actor and I did stand up comedy, got into improv troops. I mean, just, just the whole everything sure. clown show. And, um, when I was in acting, I just, I really just hated the process of it. I loved performing, hated the process of, you know, driving to an audition that was, you know, two hours of traffic, one, one way there, five o'clock sure. in LA. And, um, it was just a nightmare. It wasn't fun. And so the whole business side of it just really, killed it for me. And then I just kind of retorted back to doing music. And at the same time, this is kind of when YouTube was kind of, you know, blowing up and right. everybody was kind of putting stuff up there just for fun, just to see what would happen. And and I'd always done um, just mimicking of like South Park and Family Guy and like these kind of fun Futurama type shows. Right, and right. so I just started putting up videos of, of me doing voices just for the hell of it. And um some guy from Louisiana who ran a bong shop. Uh, <laughs> of, yeah, of all things. All right, all right. <laughs> he, he messages me and says, "Hey, man, like, I want you to uh, make me some radio ads with like some Star Wars impersonations and Family Guy." And I was like, "Okay, sure." <laughs> so, but he would have me do all the music, so I'd make the jingle, and it took forever to do this thing. Right. And then finally, uh, he had me, you know, obviously do the voices, and it was so much fun doing those, and such a pain to do the um, the music. But you know, he paid me. I think it was like two hundred bucks for you know the music, and then two hundred bucks, I think, for the voiceover. And I was like, "Wait, what?" Like, right. That, I, the voiceover took nothing to do, and and I always say it. You know, it's the laziest entertainment job there is, and yet one of the most prosperous and abundant jobs there is at, at the same time. So here I was. I didn't have to drive across town. I didn't have to dress up. You know, and I just discovered this whole thing where the you know and these platforms came out that were just like oh all the advertising agencies and clients are now starting to post these job briefs on on these websites like voices.com right and so i jumped on that train pretty hard and i was awful i i had never had a class i never you know didn't understand advertising and so 
I mean, I still keep a lot of my old auditions too, and I'll go back and listen to them and just go, oh my <laughs> God. <laughs> uh, yeah. So long story short, um, it was, it was a, a big journey to go from all these kind of entertainment and performing aspects into the, into a closet basically, and kind of use all of that, that wisdom and, and things I had learned from the business side of things into doing these auditions and starting to book jobs. So fast forward, I think it's been 10 years, 11 years I've been doing this now, um, I guess five or six professional. Um, it's really turned into the, the booming business. And I'm just, you know, obviously so grateful and blessed to be doing what I'm doing. And I, you do it all from the comfort of your home. Or I go on vacation and I, I pack up the laptop and microphone with me and, you know, I'm doing it there. So it's just exploded um, the amount of work you can get and do and the easeability of, of doing it all has just become right. pretty phenomenal. Yeah, that's great. So like David, the founder of Voices, you kind of stumbled upon your career. Um, but what advice do you have for people who are interested in getting into voice acting, like how would you get into it today if you were starting out right now? Yeah, that's a good question. Has the game changed since you first got into it? The game has changed um, for the good, I would say. It, it used okay. to be that the voiceover world or, or niche was a small group of people you know, in Hollywood doing it, you know, the, the Don LaFontaine, um, you know, people doing The Simpsons. Right. Um, so it was such a niche business for the longest time, and that all has completely changed. And I think for a lot of other industries as well, this has changed too. So what happened was the internet happened and social media happened. And so instead of everything being centralized in Hollywood or with TV specifically, you have you know, your phones, you have the, the radio, you have um, just all the, you know, YouTube, all these different platforms out there that can advertise your product to the right market right. and do it wildly more efficiently now. So for someone wanting to get into voiceover, um, it's just unbelievable how much jobs are out there right now. And, yeah. and you can really target things that, you know, it would be easier for you to get into. And if you're, if you're totally green, um, you've never done voiceover and always kind of interested in it. I think one thing that scares a lot of people out of doing it is that it, it seems like it's a complicated system, you know, uh, I'm going to have a hard time booking jobs. I got to pay a bunch of money up front to join like, you know, a website or buy a microphone. Right. And I'm always trying to be, I think the, the encouraging voice or the voice of reason in this and just go, don't, don't let anybody tell you, you have to do it a certain way, or you have to spend this much money, or you have to take a class. You don't have to do any of that. I didn't do any of that. I, if I did teach a class, it'd be 90% of, Hey, this is what you shouldn't do because I made all these dumb mistakes. myself. <laughs> and then, yeah. you know, but it, it just barrels down to, um, you know, you don't have to have a great voice. I didn't have a great voice when I started. I had to learn and figure out how to, you know, manipulate my voice and, and talk naturally and understand that, you know, there's jobs all over the spectrum. You know, I think a lot of people are thinking, oh, I want to go book like the, the $30,000 SAG job for Nike. And right. I, I've hardly done any of those. Like the, mm -hmm. the money, the, the work is all in non-union and because everything's going to non-union has been going to non-union for years. And that means other businesses, um, they can afford to advertise now. They can afford to put stuff on on, on a YouTube pre-roll ad or, or a Facebook or Instagram blast. And that's right. so much cheaper than saying, you know, oh, let's go spend $100,000 on a TV ad and, you know, pay, you know. So bottom line, it's there's so many great ways to get into it. The technology has just got out of control with what you can do. When I was first starting, you know, if I got an audition, you know, or two a week, it was a big deal. And now I, I'm waking up to like over a hundred possibilities of, of wow. jobs out there. And I'm, I just have to turn down so many because, you know, there's like, well, you could do this job for a hundred bucks and it's like a, you know, two minute ad, or here's like a, a, a an audio book that's like 30,000 words for, you know, whatever it is. So whatever you're kind of into, or you think you're, you might be good at, or you can do a specific voice, or you just kind of want to start learning it's just a great place, any of these platforms, just to see what is coming out there, what these brands, these clients, these agencies are looking for, and, and just give us some practice, you know, submit some auditions. And the bottom line is, yes, you do have to spend a little bit of money up front, but compared to any other business, this isn't like Starbucks to where, okay, now we have to order the next round of coffee beans 
Um, right. You know, you, you buy a, ma- a mic and a laptop and you're done. Well, you book one job that's paid for. And then your money maker is just hot air. You know, right. you don't ever have to invest in anything else again. <laughs> I'm still using true. the same microphone from like 12, 15 years ago. That actually segues in. We were wondering, like, so what is, have you done any gear upgrades since then? Or is that, is that where it ended? Very minute. I mean, obviously, like your your computers keep changing over time. They get faster and more efficient. Sure. Um, but you know, they last. If you get a good one, like they'll they'll last for you know four or five years. And right. then if you want to upgrade, you can. Um, like the editing systems, um, like a lot of your computers come with them. So right. you know, and, and editing voiceover. I mean, it's the simplest thing in the world. You're not creating a symphony here, right? Um, right. But the microphone, I pride myself in telling people this, especially new people that think they need to go buy this $3,000, $10,000 microphone to sound so good, you know? And I'm right. like, my dad bought me this 20, 20 years ago for music. And this bad boy has, has, you know, been beat up and traveled with me everywhere. And I just, I'm like, I refuse to go get something better because I'm just like, see, you don't have to. It, it, it's not the microphone. I mean, it's hardly ever the microphone anyways. Yeah, with that's process, the, uh, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. David said the same thing, uh, that it really isn't the microphone. More importantly, have a soundproof room. Uh, is that something that you work on at home? Not really. I mean, really? and that's another thing. I, I, I've, yeah. I've got the minute amount of soundproofing. I see these people with... Um, <laughs> these gigantic closets and just, I mean, spend mm-hmm. a fortune probably on these things. I just kind of laugh and go, you don't need that much. You need some carpet <laughs> on the floor, Meg maybe a sound panel here. I- I'm looking at a <laughs> pillow right now. That's like my soundproof thing. And you know, yeah, it's just like, yep. it, you really don't need to overcomplicate what it is. It, it's obviously taking me a little time. I, I don't want to like b- put too much um, uh, sugar coating on this, I guess, but it's obviously my the wisdom I've gotten from doing this for so long, from doing sound editing. I know how to make my voice sound good in any environment. And, exactly. and it's just small tweaks here and there, but you just learn that as you go. Right. Yeah, no, I, I worked in music for a long time and I had the exact same experience. I've had a vocal booth in my house that I built out of a IKEA wardrobe. And it actually yeah. ended up it ended <laughs> up sounding worse. <laughs> than just really? an open yeah than just an open room with with uh with bed foam behind it so uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah it really depends on like the the voice what you're trying to get i agree i think i think gear can be a little bit of a money pit for a lot of people so l- let me ask you this um you obviously are now in a place where you're taking on a lot of different jobs uh, uh at scripted here we obviously have a freelance situation as well um, all of our writers, as they grow, are taking on more and more jobs as freelancers. How do you balance that with your with your life? As far as um, like maintaining or getting new jobs, or, or or yeah, or even when you're taking on like a lot of jobs at once. I mean, how 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 can you balance that your professional life with with your private life? Is it very time consuming? Like if you're doing an audio book or or something like that? Oh God, yeah. I mean. Thankfully, I have no personal life, so it's all business. Um, <laughs> so I can dedicate a lot of time. But you know, it's easy for me because I'm, you know, I'm I'm married. I'm not I'm I'm single. I, I don't have a lot of distractions. And right. the all of a sudden, this business for me started booming. You know, a couple of years ago, especially when I joined Voices, um, that I just decided, you know, I want to just grind for a while and um, just see, you know do as good as I can. So it's, it's easier for me, like someone who has, you know, wife and kids or, you know, a dog or <laughs> whatever it might be like, that's, you know, keeping you distracted, um, in a, in a positive way, obviously, uh, it's, it's tough. You know, there's so much opportunity out there though, that, you know, I sit here 18 hours a day and do voiceover wow. and it, it's a grind. It's, it's, you know, it's not the funnest thing in the world, but when you can get in a rhythm of booking jobs and all of a sudden, Hey, you know, I, I booked a job and I auditioned for 10 more, like you can snowball out of control so fast. Yeah. And that's, and it's really fun for a season to do. And I'm, and I'm getting to that point where I'm just like, Oh, I'm, I'm so tired. I'm, I'm burnt from doing this, like this hardcore. But, um, that's what I'm, trying to say is encouraging to any other freelancer out there like the amount of things that you can do from home um and fish for jobs while you're doing jobs or revising jobs it's just it's a whole new world it's a wild west and there is just gold in the streets (laughs) i think uh, i think what people don't realize probably is how physical it can be 
to do voiceover. Can you tell us like, yeah, how do you, you know, take care of your voice? How do you kind of manage that? Like you're without overdoing it with your 18 hours a day. You know, it's, it's not even so much the, the voice. It's ironically voiceover doing it 18 hours a day destroys your whole body from just sitting here all day, mm -hmm. you know, and right. I went through kind of the same thing with, I did editing for many, many long hours uh, with a production company I still run. And it just, it takes the toll for sure. So I've had to learn to, you know, try to take more breaks, do stretching, keep in shape somehow, some way. And it's just, it's interesting how, how your body just deteriorates doing this. Like the voice thing for me, um, you know, I say I do 18 hours a day voiceover, but that's not me constantly yapping. Um, right. Mo I mean, I think 60% of the business is me just trying to keep organized with all the, with the jobs and the auditions and the revisions. It's, mm -hmm. it's more just like a, how, how good a multitasker can you be to manage all this stuff? Because if you, like I said, I, I could sit here and, you know, audition for a couple jobs a day, you know, maybe get one, do it tomorrow, go on vacation, you know, but I've kind of just decided, you know, this is an opportunity that not a lot of people get to do. And the, the, op the auditions, the opportunities are there and they're just being thrown in my face. And I'm like, I want to do them all. Right. I know I, can, I know I can't do it forever, <laughs> but I want to do it all for right well, now. Well, you can. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Capitalize, yeah. What, um, so tell us a little bit about some of the stranger requests. I mean, you opened up here with the bong shop, so I know there's probably <laughs> a lot more underneath there. Yeah, you know, there, there's there been some weird ones for sure. Um, I think one of the jobs I did, this is a couple years ago, um, some gal had asked me to do like a like a video game they were developing and i was oh, like okay. cool i'd love that and so they said we want you to you want you to play this character that's really like just a full-on jerk and uh you know kind of the, the whole thing with it and i and i said okay well, it'll be fun challenge be fun challenge for sure because i'm usually a pretty happy you know go lucky guy that'll, yeah. that'll be interesting to do and then i kept getting the scripts and they just kept devolving into this really like weird kind of like pornographic type of <laughs> Why did I know game? it was going there? Yeah, and I, and I just, I, one script, I was just like, you know, I just can't. <laughs> like, I turned down the job. So, God. I was like, um, but like, you know, like audiobooks and like these really long form projects, I, I avoid them like the plague because. Really? Like I, like I just said, when you're doing like, you know, 18 hours a day, it, you, you don't have time to do these, you know, 30,000, 100,000 reads. And I mean, that's what'll kill your voice, I think, so fast. Right. And then you're just, you're stuck doing that and say, you know, what if I did like 14 pages and they're like, you know what? We didn't really like the accent or the voice you had. Can you do it all over again? Uh, so, yeah. Oh my God, no. <laughs> yeah. That yeah, is awful. I mean, tell, us, tell us a little bit about what you, what's been your favorite job as a voiceover. Um. One of the one of the early jobs I got on on voices was I really love um, uh, kind of like David Attenborough type narrations for Discovery Channel type stuff and nice. I, I booked it was something um, about like island creatures and some animals I'd never seen before and I just love seeing animals outdoors because I'm never outdoors you know <laughs> stuck in my closet here all day <laughs> but uh, I just I really love narrating that kind of stuff and then. Um, you know, they'll have me sometimes do like a British accent, like a, like a David Attenborough type of thing. So it's just the fun challenge of it. Cause you know, you'll do these like 30 second, just like technology ads constantly. And they all say the exact same thing. Of course. It's, it's the whole, we're all in this together and business technology, <laughs> corporations and innovations. And, uh. <laughs> but they're over there. Well, that's what pays. So you know, can't knock them too hard. How'd you, how'd you, uh, how'd you learn the British accent? I, we, I was going through your reel and came across it. It's really impressive. Is that something like you study or is it just something that you've picked up throughout the year? Oh no. <laughs> uh, you know, I've, I've always been a, a mimicker kind of when I said I was starting back, you know, yeah, like yeah, yeah. impressions of, of South Park and stuff like that. So I kept seeing all these jobs that come out for British or Australian. And I was just like, you know, I wonder if a guy could capitalize on that. And, uh, <laughs> so that's a big market, you know, because there's so many. Yeah. And the cool stuff is usually like the stuff that pays is like the luxury car commercial, the watch commercial, the James Bond type thing. And I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to tap into that money, you know. So I started just listening to um, a lot of different like 
voiceovers that were that were British, and most of them were celebrities. And, and my go-to is kind of Tom Hiddleston because I was like, oh, I think I got somewhat of the same timber of voice this guy has. Right. He's like wildly more successful and ten times better voices than I am. But <laughs> I was like, I can be the knockoff version of this guy, and hopefully gets away with it. You know. So <laughs> um, I just started trying it, and it was terrible. You know, my first couple years doing it but then you know you you learn and you develop it a little bit and you figure out okay kind of the the nuances of it and then i started getting hired like over and over i think i do more british voiceovers now than american no really? way and then, yeah really? and then you even get into doing like i did a danish one not that long ago like kind of a <laughs> german have you and, run this have you run these voices by any british or danish people and like gotten some feedback on yeah it? what's the, the feedback oh like? yeah oh yeah like the, the funny thing is I'll, I'll do a british accent and typically it's not a British company that hires you to do it because they don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but British companies actually like it because they're like, we don't know where you're from because there's so many different dialects in Britain. They're like, we like that you're kind of the the blended version of like, we don't know where the hell you're from. Ah, <laughs> so, yeah. And the British accent. Dialect. Yeah, yeah. And it's become kind of a, the, they call it the transatlantic uh, accent where it's like right. this global, where it really fits into... Like, is that uh, what Madonna no. ended up having? Maybe so. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's worked out pretty good. And um, I still tell people, you know, it's, I'm not the, the greatest, but I can pull it off for a 30 second ad. I mean, you're getting hired for it. So yeah, yeah I'll take it. But that's about, I think that's where the line is. And I think you crossed it. That's, yeah. that's excellent. <laughs> you mentioned uh, Tom Middleton. Who are your guys? Like, you know, you have to have some guys, right? You're like uh, voice acting heroes or who, who you'd aspire to be. Oh gosh, I mean, yeah. There's there's tons of them out there. Um, I I just kind of pay attention to whatever's popular at the time because I'm just I'm just in the business mindset at this point. You know, right, the, right. The art and the you know the 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 coolness has has kind of worn off for me from from doing it so long. So I'm kind of in the business mindset of like, okay, what are these clients? What are their? What are, what they, are they looking want? for? You right, know, what's right. popular? And that's like a anything from like a Tom Hiddleston to uh, I do a lot of John Hamm type commercials. Right. He's a uh, um, what Mercedes now? Mercedes Benz. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So anything like that, I, I really pay attention to and just go, okay, now I know collectively when I go into these auditions, what the clients are looking for. And there's a, there's a huge difference between what you think is good for an audition. Like some of these uh, scripts you'll see, they'll say, uh, we're looking for, um, uh, you know, a Tom Hiddleston or a Morgan Freeman, and every voiceover goes, "Oh, I'm going to do a, a dead-on impression of a Morgan Freeman." And mm -hmm. you're just going, "No, no, 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 no." That's that's not what they're truly looking for. They're looking. They want the gravitas of of that. yeah, right. And they're they're right. saying like this ad's popular, so we want to do that. And it's that simple. Once you start yeah. learning like how the system works, you know, one thing uh, we were curious about because I think it was not too long ago there was that whole thing with the the. Screen Actors Guild and, and the strikes that were happening. What is it like out there for for voice talent and rates? Is there a struggle for this, like with people getting started? I mean, obviously you're in a great place now, which is awesome. Um, but you know, as you were saying earlier, like some of the non uh, union jobs are are where the money's at. Well, uh, yeah, that's true. I, I have um, a lot of friends that are brand new to the business, they'll kind of ask me, you know, is this, what should I bid for this job? Or, and a lot of professional friends that I have that are, will hit me up and just go, you know, am I getting screwed here type of thing? Right, right. And, um, and my answer is always kind of, it, it's a case by case basis. Again, it used to be a centralized network of, you know, these big money jobs. And now it has kind of just spread out to like a, a quantity of jobs versus quality of jobs. The quantity comes from non-union and that's the world I stay in because I, I just like to work, you know, right. it's, it may be lower paying, but you know, you book a bunch of these jobs, it stacks up very, very quick versus waiting to like hit the jackpot for three, five years to make, you know, what someone could make in a month doing non-union. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So with, with the prices, I've gotten a lot better at it now, kind of just recognizing that, okay, I can tell this company's brand new, up and coming. They don't have a lot of money. I'm willing to work with them. I'd rather like do the job that takes me five minutes to record and make, you know, a hundred bucks versus like go to a restaurant and work a shift and not make a hundred bucks. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You that know? Makes sense. So that's my mindset. But obviously if it's like, oh, we want to just 
put this on the Super Bowl and you know use it for the end of time. We got two hundred bucks, and I'm like, yeah, probably not. <laughs> right, 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 right. Um, so tell us a little bit about Spexter. Yeah, you know, I didn't didn't want to go too off topic here, but it kind of routes back to voiceover. Um, Spexter is a combination of all of my experiences I've had in LA, um, and I'm founding it with my my business partner Jed Williams, who also does voiceover and does well. Um, we were friends out here doing acting, doing improv classes, the whole bit, and we decided that we wanted to be serious for two seconds and <laughs> try to start a business. Right, and so we loved filming. Uh, we were uh, kind of loosely filming like spec commercials for, you know, these commercial contests that these different platforms would host. And we would go out just with friends, with a camera, I would edit and we put together like a 30 second commercial that was kind of fun. And we were, we were big on humor. And so we'd, we'd make it funny. So we'd submit these and they would, they started getting bought by these brands and these clients that just needed to advertise, you know, not on TV, but just on social media on these right. different channels just because why not it doesn't cost them hardly anything compared to their their mega budget they're using right right so we got into doing this production company and did very very well for a long time we shot over i think 100 200 commercials with a bunch of different brands um and you wow. know big brands too is really it was really fun and it just became this like a pretty hard grind of you know you don't make a lot of money it's a lot of hustle but also a big payoff to of, of learning i mean we had to do everything from write to produce to pitch to run the camera to pick up trash on set while the other one directs wow um and it was like man it was it was such a hard struggle to basically not almost break even because we just kept doubling down anything we would sell we would immediately put in the next budget so spexter kind of comes along uh, a few years later and we kind of said you know what if we could get back to having fun with filmmaking again and go out and shoot what we want to film, not what a, a client dictates that's really a watered down idea um, that's you know going to be a grind? What if we could just go out and film anything we wanted and adapt it to any brand out there that would want it? You know, so what Spexter does, it 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 opens up the doors for right now specifically filmmakers and a lot of creatives to create whatever they want, their passion project. It could be as simple even as a lens test, something out there, and just put it on our platform. And then basically you have a 90% made commercial that we are pushing to clients and, and agencies out there that can add their 10% of branding into it. And so now you've made the whole commercial process <laughs> instant. It's just like, hey, browse for an ad. There's one great, You know, here's my logo film my product, whatever it might be for a revision quick, and then we're done. Amazing. And so all of these, again, ex experiences with voiceover and working with clients and doing this production company and knowing all these worlds kind of go into this one thing. And it's just supposed to open up, uh, I think, a lot more fun uh, ways for filmmakers anywhere in the world now to submit something and get hired or get discovered, whatever it might be. So we're trying to be, uh, the best way to explain it is like the Netflix of ads, or like right. the Uber of hiring a filmmaker. And how many uh, filmmakers do you have on the platform right now? Uh, we've been launched for, I think, a little less than six months. I think we've got about, a, I think, 130, 150 filmmakers that have uploaded stuff. We run wow. a few contests with um, just kind of our own internal contests of like, you know, who can you know upload a, a cool spec ad. And then now we're trying to tailor the industry and these filmmakers to go, okay, here is what you know, some of these new up and coming clients are looking for that are, you know, have a budget of, you know, five to $10,000. And basically you go out and film a non-branded commercial, just have a, a storytelling piece of uh, work that you can do. And it's very different from stock footage because stock footage is like you buy a single clip and, you know, it's, uh, it doesn't tell a story. You still have right. to build it yourself. And we're saying, no, 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 we, we've, We've built everything for you. It's on a silver platter. You can buy the ad as is. You can buy all the B-roll. You can buy a 15-second cut down of it or buy the whole package, whatever you want to do. So we just try to make the process really, really simple for the advertiser. And then the filmmaker can just say they put their own price on it. 
And right. so we don't dictate any prices or what you do is like, it's, it's your free reign world. Yeah, that's super cool. And so essentially then the buyer will add context to the footage, presumably in that case. Yeah, basically, uh, the, the advertiser will come on and just be able to browse like a Netflix, uh, right. say something that's in the wheelhouse of what their brand is. Ah, and cool. So, so maybe, yeah, maybe it's like a holiday or, you know, we're, we're really into like hunting type stuff. So they can go on and do a search and find something in that world and just go, okay, what are the possibilities now? And we, we, you know, play matchmaker to filmmaker and, and, and buyer and just say, um, we could do is something as simple as slap your logo at the end. It's already built. Or you know what? You can hire the filmmaker to go do a pickup shot or just refilm the whole thing. But the, the point is we make the process a lot, lot faster and cheaper for yeah. both parties involved. Yeah, that's yeah. an awesome idea. Yeah, it sounds like, uh, I mean, one of the most difficult things for a freelance creative is to really market themselves and get themselves connected with a buyer. And it sounds like Spexter is kind of a solution to that. Well, again, it comes back to a not having a centralized system anymore. So we, we've decentralized mm -hmm. the whole platform to where you don't have to be out in Hollywood. You don't have to be, you know, go to go to film school. Everybody can pick up a camera, go to YTU, YouTube University, get an education on how to do the bare minimum and film something. So where as when we started, it was kind of like we needed to be out here. We needed to be around, you know, these locations and these these agencies and stuff to right. do this business. Now you don't have to do that. I mean, anybody can pick up an iPhone, go film an, like a Super Bowl ad in their backyard, yeah. and it's, it's going to be as equal quality as what we were shooting, you know, 10 years ago on amazing cameras. Right. So, you know, we, we've awarded people in, in Moldova uh, for stuff that they've done, uh, like countries I've never even heard of. <laughs> but we're getting people signed up that are, you know, are able to, like, now be discovered through this platform. And and that's what's exciting for us because it's like we, we kind of struggled and went through the weeds of – Oh, we got to do the typical process of come out to you know Los Angeles and drive through traffic. Now you don't have to do that. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, let me let me ask you this too to bring it back because I think it kind of ties in as well um, with what Spexter is doing. But what do you think about the future of say both the voiceover gig economy, but also with stuff that you're doing uh, with Spexter? Like, what do you think uh, we're going? I guess in terms of the industry. Uh, and the gig economy in general. Are there any trends that you see developing that are moving forward into the future? Oh, yeah. I mean, tons. Um, and it's and it's kind of fun to, to keep track of and, and plan according. I'm, I'm a big, you know, 10 years forward thinking kind of guy. Right. So my my escape hatch is, is, is Spexter, obviously. And right. voiceover, thankfully, has been a booming thing for me, which is funding uh, the startup and, you know, getting it all put together. So, yep. I would, you know, very much love to get out of voiceover at a certain point. I'm a guy that, you know, doesn't stick with one career too long anyways, but I want right. to figure it out. I want to master it. And then I want to build something else with it. And so the great, great news for any freelancer out there, it doesn't matter if you're voiceover, filmmaker, writer, whatever it is, there are so many opportunities right now because advertising, I mean, you are advertised to death. Let's be honest. You get in your car, you, you get on your phone, you get on YouTube, you know, TV. Yep. It's just they're going to find a way to sell you products. And now you have an, a, an economy to where anybody can create a product in five seconds, you know, spend a hundred bucks to advertise it. And they need your creativity, your spin to bring it to life where that didn't ever used to be the case. It was always a very niche group of people and budgets that were doing it. And now anybody can do it. And so it's just a matter of how ambitious do you want to be and go after it. Um, and even with voiceover, um, a lot of people are like, well, what do you think about voiceover AI? And, uh, and I said, oh, it's, it's going to kill half the industry. I mean, or more in yeah. four or five years. Yep. So capitalize now while it's hot but at the same time you know maybe you should try to invest in being one of those voiceover ais and get those <laughs> royalties every time they play your voice. That's I don't right. know. but technology will just continue to i mean exponentially get crazier and crazier and that you sh we shouldn't look at that as a negative this should be like how can you capitalize on that and how can you make it work for you yeah that's yeah genius. absolutely Definitely all about uh, how you're going to hustle over the next couple of years. Am I right? <laughs> yeah. And that's the thing. It's like the, it is more of a hustle because there's so much more competition now at the same time. So it's kind right. of a, a give and take. Well, John, we'd be remiss if we didn't ask you to, to perform for us a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So if you could, if you wouldn't mind, uh, could you basically do a pitch for this podcast right now using your British accent? <laughs> <laughs> All right, give me my script here. <laughs> Let's see. Put something up there, Kevin, into the Word doc. Yeah, give me one minute. Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, we'd also love to hear anything that, uh, I mean, we know we got everything for, for specs there, but uh, anything else that you're working on, any other projects? Um, you know, wait, wait, I'm still kind of loosely running the production company. My my business partner, Jed, is kind of like keeping that all together, thankfully. Um, yeah. That's pretty nifty productions is our is our production company and, and website pretty nifty TV. And um, that's where we post a lot of our commercials that we've done for these these brands. I have a lot of my uh, current voiceover work on there with like the actual videos and stuff. So you yeah, can see yeah, I checked out your reel there. Yeah, awesome. So thank you, thank you. But yeah, I mean that's that's kind of the the three big ones. And and Spexter is obviously um, you know it's very new and, and growing, but we've got a big phase two launch coming in uh, a few weeks here, and we're really excited to show it to everybody. So. We've already gotten a great response and we're just actively pushing, pushing, pushing to get people's content seen and purchased and just more than anything, get get people working with the environment that we're in right now. So um, I encourage anyone just to check out uh, Spexter. It's kind of a weird way we, we wrote it, but <laughs> www.spexter. Make sure there's two S's in there because it'll take you somewhere else you don't want to go. <laughs> um as is the but, case uh, with domains. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we just, I came up with a name because I wanted something like, like spec in, in, you know, the title. And of course you go through uh, all the website domains and everything's taken. So we just kind of invented a word. Was that, and, was that the route? Is that how you came up with the name? Basically. basically yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I always, and, uh, I always overlook the domain name, name creation method, but it is a very strong one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it kind of when you when you type it in, it would it would come up with uh, Speedster to autocorrect you, and I was like, that's that's ah. pretty good. It sounds like Speedster, Spexter. That's kind of what we're doing here. But yep, yep. Um, yeah, somebody else apparently, I think a a German company uh, has like basically the same name, like but minus an S, and it's um, kind of like a, a adult store of some sorts okay. so a lot of people we tell the website they go there and they're just like oh what is this you guys are selling yeah, what is it you guys do again <laughs> like oh no it's not that we promise <laughs> oh goodness um <clears throat> all right I, I, kevin I terrible, you got something there i have a terrible script for you <laughs> <laughs> oh i love it i love it all right i gotta get my song plan just so i uh i don't know if you can hear this or not but this is get me in the mood here all right ready ready from the dawn of time, there has been many podcasts that failed to live up to the hype and left you wanting more. That time is over. The podcast you've all been waiting for is here. The Scripted Podcast. Open your ear holes for this. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, wow, man. All right. I mean, you can tell the level of professionalism. It really that was. Shift I was thought just... Tom Middleson was in the room. <laughs> I, want, I want my residuals every time you play that too. the call is coming from inside the house <laughs> yeah of course uh john thank you so much for joining us this was a blast and uh yeah we'll be reaching out of course to to follow up with you and and see more of what's happening with spexter and, and congratulations with all your success it's obviously very deserved no no thank you guys very much for having me and uh thank you to david and his wife stephanie for putting together a great platform it's obviously been wonderful for me to capitalize on and do well with so um just thankful 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 appreciate it awesome thanks, thanks man all right that about does it for the scripted podcast this week uh be sure to join us next time and in the meantime please be sure to like comment or subscribe on whichever platform you choose to listen 